Lebanese have seen the walls of their capital, Beirut, fall time and time again. But the catastrophic explosion of the 4th of August is described by many here as the biggest tragedy in the country's history. <laughs> Talia Lahoud is 18 years old, too young to remember much of Lebanon's history, but she sings this iconic song to Beirut as if she has seen it all. Close to 3,000 tons of ammonium nitrate stored at the capital's port blew up in an explosion that was heard across the Mediterranean. Around 180 people were killed, thousands injured, hundreds of thousands made homeless. The repair bill will cost billions. The government resigned, but the consequences remain. The Lebanese once again came out to pick up the pieces. Lebanon is described as the beginning of the Orient and the beginning of the West. It's seen the flourishing of diverse civilizations. From the Phoenicians to the Romans and ever since, it's been at the crossroads of different faiths and beliefs, conquered by the Ottomans and the French. Enduring 15 years of civil war and conflicts with Syria and Israel. Nobody knows what will come next, but the Lebanese capital has always been at the heart of this region's art and culture a crutch in difficult times. I'm Stephanie Decker in Beirut. The capital's old opera house still stands, but broken. No voices have filled it for decades since before the Civil War. And the ever-changing journey of the Lebanese nation has been written about in many history books. And it's been narrated, painted, and sung about by its artists and thinkers. From Gibran, Khalil Gibran, to Feirouz, to Saeed Akel. On this edition of Talk to Al Jazeera, we'll be joined by Lebanon's contemporary artists and intellectuals. We'll be exploring how their work reflects what is happening here. Guy Manoukian is a musician, a pianist and composer, and has recently produced a track with the American artist Wyclef Jean. The proceeds will be going to charity to help rebuild Beirut and help its people after the catastrophic explosion of the 4th of August. The lyrics are really nice, really deep. And um, what we talked about a lot, like always the protest songs, the problem with the protest songs is that they always sound like protest songs. Whereas if you take like Bob Marley, 80% of his songs were protest songs. They sounded like love songs. She said Beirut. It's the cedar of God. Cedar of God. How long must we wait? How long? Even when the bomb blasts, we're gonna rise from the ash. That's our story. You started, I was reading, you started playing piano when you were four? Yep. Wow. That's I pretty incredible. Now, the good and bad things of being in Lebanon. I start at four because I was jealous from my brothers. 
who were older than me and they used to play. Actually, I started at three, but I couldn't. <laughs> three? They tell, that's what they tell okay. me. That I couldn't play because my fingers were, <laughs> don't look at them now. <laughs> they were quite small. Right. And uh, uh, then I got hooked to the piano b because of really trivial and stupid things. At that time, we had a lot of power shortages. Still, don't <laughs> you still have them? <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say it. Yeah. <laughs> we still have them after like 40 years. And uh, the piano didn't need electricity. So it was one of these toys that I had that didn't need batteries or electricity or something. Look how, I mean, trivial. You've got such a fragmented country. Yeah. Can music unite? Yes, of course music can unite. Of course music can unite and music should unite. Art in general should unite. I'm not talking only about mm. music. The theater should unite. Theater is very important, especially in, in revolutions. Books might unite. Uh, articles, the newspapers, that are most of them are dead now. We should revive them. So tell me a little bit about how you use music. I mean, you've just produced this incredible song. You're a composer, you're a pianist. Where do you get your inspiration from and what is the message? I mean, is it about humanity? Is it political? Like, how do you...? I've always been close to uh, social, uh, if you want, uh, things. And, and, uh, and I've always fought for uh, having uh, a better Lebanon. I'm totally in love with this country, but I feel like I'm in love with a person that doesn't love me back. I played a tune called, I would love to play it for you today, called Ahwaka Bila Amali, like I love you with no hope. And, and that's how our relationship is with Lebanon. It's like when you're in love with a bad person and your parents tell you that this person is bad, your friends tell you that this person is bad. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> cheating on you. The relationship we have with this country is toxic, but not because of the country. It's been run in a very bad way since the late 60s. We've lost our country since then. We love this country and we're still, we still believe that there's good in it. If the right people arrive to the right places and the reforms are done. So when you talk about your music, I mean, where does it, where does it come from? How do you, when you compose, where does it come from? Daily you... life. You know, I'm always asked the question that how do you compose? Like, what do you do? It's the stupidest thing to do is to isolate yourself and to say that today I'm going to do music or today I'm doing... You have to live a normal life. Music and art comes from life itself. So if you are not loved, you cannot make music. If you do not love, you cannot make music. If you are not envied, you cannot make music. If you don't hate, you cannot make music. It comes from deep passion. It comes from everything. And I always tell myself that every time I'm, I'm, I'm short on stories, because at the end of the day, I'm telling a story in music or in song or whatever, just go to the airport. And at the airport, at the, at the, at the welcoming part, at the arrivals, you will see so many stories. Oh, yeah, yeah, I agree. You will see the daughter coming back home after years. You will see the son coming back home to bury a grandfather or a mother or a, or a relative. You will see the kids waiting for their father to come because he's been working in, abroad. And, and uh, you would see a, a woman wa waiting for her, for her, her boyfriend or, or whatever. Like, these are the stories that make me do music. The airport and the concept of leaving and returning is a theme artist Yazan Halwani is exploring in his most recent works. This, this image that a lot of people post when they come to Lebanon, which is the, you know, I'm back to Lebanon, uh, I take a picture of Beirut from the, from the plane. And I think people think of it as, oh, this very uh, happy moment, but it's, it's symptomatic of a very sad economic and political reality that we need to take uh, grasp of. And I th also the title of this series is, it's a quote by Mahmoud Darwish, perhaps the moon is beautiful because it is far, which tries to describe kind of our paradoxical relationship with Lebanon. When you're there, you want to be out. When you're out, you want to be there. And it's kind of a, this weird cycle that uh, I felt many, many times. And then the second one, the second part of the series is these, is that the chaos associated with the migration itself. We have this one, we have the one next to you. And, and these are like, I think these are like 
a lot of art in Lebanon has focused on, you know, the, the, the very obvious civil war, like destruction and stuff, but there is a much more subtle uh, psychological psychological and, and there's the, the language of the migration which is if you think about what are communalities between the Lebanese who are from different sects and really ally themselves to their sects we don't have that many things except these things right the symptoms of the the the, the system we live in these actually talk about how people are pushed out of their countries to become to some degree re assets so in terms of your inspiration I mean you didn't live the civil war is it a legacy that you do feel and you do have and does it affect your work when you say civil war like I think uh, I think the general agreed uh, is basically the, the the armed conflict but if you think about what we, what I lived I, I was born post 90s I've never seen like uh, the civil war that most people talk about but the thing is the, the civil war was institutionalized uh, to a large degree, the government became a vehicle for the same people that were fighting the war to take public office and uh, basically uh, run these kind of uh, skirmishes or these battles within institutions to take, uh, instead of taking land uh, physically in, the, in, this, in, the, in Lebanon, they were taking kind of positions uh, throughout the government and draining the country's resources. Are you trying to educate people, raise awareness, give hope, give a message. I mean, how do you see your sort of journey as an artist? Has it changed? I have a problem with, uh, I think personally, with people who are indifferent to, uh, they say, oh, like, for example, I don't need to care about politics or the economy or the order we live in because, like, I just can go about my own personal life where completely separately. separately. Yeah. But this is not true. If where, where you choose to be located, the oppression you feel at the airport, and even even your, the most basic of utilitarian objects, which is the electric plug, is defined by uh, political economy, uh, politics, the, the the global world order we live in. Then you are not indifferent; you are just clueless about your what is what is designing your life. So this is where the creations happen. Yeah, yeah, the the workspace. Going back to this theme of like people being indifferent and not being uh, aware of uh, how different, how politics and uh, the, the kind of the global world order impacts their identity, I think I've chosen the most utilitarian of objects that is really rich and is vestigial of all those dynamics of political economy and history that have happened. And I think a lot of people that travel at a really f f you know superficial level, they start collecting these outlets and uh, sockets and. Uh, converters that don't really match each other and it leads to a lot of frustration which is associated with being constantly in, in different places and I think the more you travel the more unique your assortment starts getting and it becomes some degree kind of like your fingerprint but the more interesting thing is electric plugs themselves are a very kind of political object that tells the, the history of the world so for example Japan uses the US standards because it was imposed on them, on them post World War II. Uh, African countries, uh, most African countries have the, uh, the standard of European countries that correspond to them. Uh, for example, in the Gulf, we have the post World War II British mm -hmm. standard, whereas India has the pre World War II British standard. And it tells you really the story of colonization of e economic uh, powers. And also, like we were discussing, like when you travel so much, you need them. You need, to, you need the adapter to plug yeah. in, to connect, like we have to adapt when we keep traveling so much. Even the, the lexicon of, uh, of these, like it's about power, it's about uh, fitting in, it's about adapting, it's about converting, all of those things, tr it's true, right? It's uh, also, it's a very nice symbolism to what you go through as you kind of change places. No, but I'm never going to look <laughs> at a plug or an adapter in the same way. It's like it is, it's, it's, it's like a story, it's like a diary. Uh, exactly, and I think this is kind of the point of like, to some degree, art is to change your perception about things. And I think if uh, these seri this series changes your perception about the interpretation of what a plug means, So this is the entrance to your studio. Explain to us a little bit about this work. Yeah, so, so basically this is like at the time when I was doing uh, these portraits of uh, people or individuals that uh, represent the city better than the figures you typically see that are imposed on the city like politicians. On this street I decided to put uh, Asmahan. Uh, as you can see, like it's, uh, I used to paint a lot with calligraphy, so uh, a lot of the, e even the, how the, the, the portrait is composed, it's actually composed of calligraphy, which uh, in, a, in an attempt to kind of subvert the abstraction of Arab art, 
there which typically does not use figuration. It uses just, uh, it's usually very abstract. So this is iconic Fedouz. Tell me about why, why you painted her and why here? So I think this one was the first one to actually go very viral and stuff. I think th these works appeal to, they match the zeitgeist of the city back then, right? It was, there was a longing for uh, being more represented in the public space, making the public space more like them. And I think th also there was, there's a lot of association and nostalgia in Beirut. And I think these struck uh, the right chord with people so that they it resonated a lot. I feel today that if I paint something like this, it just would not resonate. It, it might actually be a bit tone deaf. And this is why I think I've moved on. And I think this kind of, to some degree, the role of the artist is to maybe make a reading of the zeitgeist of the, of the city uh, and be able to like, it's almost kind of like a communal shrink or psych psychologist, right? You try to understand and uh, dissociate the different element or deconstruct the different element that the city is passing through or people are passing through or the world is, pass is passing through and then put them in a, w in a way that makes people understand themselves. I think this did it very well in the past. I think my newer works do it for hopefully for what we're going through today. And I think it's about trying to under, becoming good at understanding ourselves. The understanding of self and our environment is something author Elias Khoury says is endemic to the process of writing and storytelling. Uh, writing is a journey, is a very uh, a, a journey, is adventure, journey is going out from yourself to others and leaving yourself to, to unexpected situations. And in this sense, uh, for me, uh, this is how I understand uh, the act of writing. More or less you discover yourself. Every time, in every new experience, you, re you discover uh, uh, deep parts of yourself which you never knew they existed before. And this is, of course, a way to, un to, to discover the others. So, in a sense, you, as a writer, uh, is a mirror. People will see themselves in the mirror, but the mirror never sees herself. This is the tragic part of writing. How much has what you've experienced uh, affected how you write, how you view things? Uh, you write your condition. You write, and, you know, you, you, before you asked me about that, I wrote about many wars. I didn't invent, I didn't go to wars, wars came to me. I mean, I live in a, in a situation of war since I was born. We have been going through uh, catastrophes since, uh, at, at least since 1948, since the, the Palestinian Nakba. And, uh, and we are living them. Um, this is our daily life. You've spoken to a lot of people when it comes to research. Have you discovered anything about the human spirit about survival, about dealing with catastrophe, about dealing with the worst of times. You know, if, if you if you read my books, it's all it, it, many of them. And you know, for example, the last book I published, which is a trilogy, I published two two uh, volumes of it entitled "The Children of the Ghetto." It's about how how people, how the instinct of life. Uh, was trying to, over, to overcome uh, the catastrophes and the tragedies. Because um, the most important thing, thing in life is life itself. There is nothing more important, more precious than life. And so human beings, when they are faced with, uh, when they are threatened, the way that people are threatened in wars and catastrophes, uh, the instinct of life recreates them, reinvents them, and gives them uh, the ability to, uh, to, uh, to live and to reinvent their lives. When this uh, terrible uh, explosion happened in Beirut and uh, we went out of this place uh, trying to find, uh, to go to the hospital, and where you find hundreds of people running in the streets of Beirut with, uh, with bleeding and, and you feel that this is the end of the world. But practically the next day you discover that they were running um, 
not from life, but they were running towards life. They were running in order to defend life. In the aftermath of the explosion, I want to get to the human psyche of how you see the situation now. How would you write it? What kind of characters would you put in it? You know, you, you've, you've lived it. This is a very personal situation for yeah. you, what has happened to Beirut, what's happened to Lebanon, for all of the Lebanese. Um, how would you portray the characters? You know, would there be energy or would there be something that is broken? Since long time, I mean, since the beginning of the civil war in 1975, went through uh, destruction and reconstruction and redestruction, as if there is a cycle of uh, destruction. Maybe this time this is the ultimate destruction, the most uh, savage, the most brutal, the biggest uh, uh, thing that happened in the city. Even, you know, in, in, in 1982, in, in August the 6th, 1982, Beirut was uh, bombed for about 17 hours by the Israeli uh, aeroplanes during the Israeli invasion. Uh, nothing. Uh, all this cannot be compared to the explosion which took place in the port. This is. What happened in the port is, was something like the atomic bomb. I'm not, I don't want to compare. Of course, Hiroshima was a much more tragic uh, situation. But if you are to compare, Hiroshima was the end of war. We are not sure that this explosion is the end of anything. We have the feeling that this explosion is part of a process of continuous destruction. And in this sense, people, uh, uh, how they, how they people feel, or I feel them. I feel that, uh, that uh, uh, this time uh, uh, there is something broken in their souls. And because there is no perspective. It's not the end of anything. It's not the beginning of anything. One of the, of the, major, uh, of the major signs of the city is that since the uh, the 50s uh, of the last century, it has been the, um, the city of uh, culture. Not of the Lebanese culture only, it was the city of the Arabic culture. And it was the city of openness towards uh, modernism, towards change, towards new, uh, new uh, styles, new approaches. And this, is very, this, ma this makes Beirut. This is why when you look at the neighborhoods which were destroyed, you feel so sad because these now, at this moment, and since after the end of the war, uh, these neighborhoods are now the neighborhoods of art. All the galleries are there, all the uh, 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 cultural activities take pla takes place there. So my feeling that this uh, explosion is an attempt to kill the spirit of the city. Never we felt that our spirit is threatened the way it is now. <laughs> The Lebanese philosopher Gibran Khalil Gibran once wrote, out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls. The most massive characters are seared with scars. This is a city and a people that have been deeply wounded. This song was sung by Fairuz during the civil war, which destroyed much of the capital. The words, just as important today as they were then. Beirut, from the depth of my heart, I send you peace. <laughs> 